better run, man Life's a pain, but you got me Yeah, life's a pain, but I got you Hey, what's up, Parasites? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog. And today we're going to talk about the recently released Venom issue 29, which, yes, I have a Wolverine cover for it. And that's just because I don't buy this book monthly anymore, typically, or I try not to. Um, I was trying to wait for the trades, but I found out this was a standalone issue that kind of sets up issues 24 and 25. So I thought, OK, for the time being, I'll buy this one. But this was the last cover they had. So, you know, I grabbed what I could. Uh, but this one also doesn't have a digital code, so I apologize for that. It does have the email one, so I emailed but it's not here in time. So whenever it does show up, I'll try to give it out, you know, on Instagram or LinkedIn or, you know, Twitter somewhere. I'll try to do that in the future. Uh, but this book is called palindrome. So if you don't know what a palindrome is, that is basically a palindrome is a phrase or a word that is the same forward as it is backwards. So like the word madam, for example, or race car or level, um, those are all the same frontwards and backwards. And so that's what a palindrome is. And that makes sense because that's what this issue is it's told in a palindrome format. And we have Al Ewing again on the writing duties, uh, coming back to do the cosmic stuff. And we have Cafu killing it with the art. I love Cafu's artwork. And this is a story about Meridius and how Tyro became the Meridius that we know. Uh, because obviously in the Garden of Time, where Meridius exists, there's other Eddies there. There was a total of six. There was the first Eddie, the first King in Black that we met in issue one when he's got the you know Space Knight kind of King in Black suit and he entered into the garden. So that Eddie was one Eddie and Meridius is like the sixth Eddie and there's an evolution between there. So you obviously have Wild, Bedlam, Finnegan, Eddie, Meridius, and Tiro. Uh, and so those six there make up the place, but it finds out or we find out that there's a seventh Eddie around as well called the eventuality so we'll get into that here we'll show it off in a second but this book it starts off through tiro's point of view and it's him you know kind of sucking up he's kind of a suck up to meridius and it's because he wants to know how do i become from tiro how do i change into meridius so he's trying to just study meridius he's still eddie in there and he knows kind of what he's been through he knows he's been bedlam he still has a little bit of uh, love for dylan and there's still a little bit of humanity in there, but he is curious. How am I going to transform into the nemesis of this story, basically, my own nemesis? How am I going to become him? So he's just studying everything that Meridius does. But then he's also a little clever. Like I said, there's a little humanity in there. So he's like, wait a minute, there's there's something. There's there, What if, you know, as I learned traveling through time and going through as Bedlam and becoming wild and all this stuff, I learned that there's a possibility that there could be a seventh Eddie here. And we keep thinking there's six, but earlier in one of the issues when, you know, Meridius was taking Eddie around, the first Eddie, he was flying him around the garden. He was saying there's seven paths, there's seven paths. And that's always kind of sat in the back of Eddie's head. And now as Tyro, he's trying to explore that. And he's like, okay, well, if there's seven paths, maybe there's seven Eddies. And so he goes through and he actually meets the seventh Eddie, which is one that the Eddie Brock who's moving through time, who went outside the loop, went outside his hamster cage, he's the, it's the same thing he interacted with, which was the giant hand. And that giant hand gave Eddie a bunch of answers and it led him on a path where he able, he was able to derail from this loop and become a wild card, if you will. Um, and it's a wild card that you don't think, well, you know, Meridius is like, oh, I'm not too worried about a wild card, whatever. And it turns out, you know, this, this may not all actually be planned anymore, now something has changed. And we'll get into that more in the next episode because Kang the Conqueror explains that. Um, but in this one, we're just getting this, the story and the evolution from Tyro to Meridius. So we're gonna go into some details. There's gonna be some spoilers here, but um, but the main thing is I wanna just show the artwork and how it goes from you know this to what we're gonna see later where all the images flip. So it's a palindrome. When you go through this book, it starts off with a splash page you know, with this image and it's gonna actually end with a version of that image with some extra details like this up here. Um, and then when you go to the second page, it's these three panels of them facing each other and you're seeing it through the point of view of Tiro. But then when you go to the end, those same three panels drawn slightly differently um, are there, but now you're seeing it through the eyes of Meridius because Tiro in this book becomes Meridius. So uh, yeah, and I like that they did that, but I honestly, and I understand you have to do that in one issue to kind of make the palindrome effect where the panels line up and everything matches forward and then backwards matches the book. Um, I get that that's important to, to sell the palindrome thing, but 
the the I think the thing that gets lost here was the fact that they've been setting up since issue like two or three that Kang the Conqueror and Eddie Brock at some point in time become friends. And I was always interested in that. Like, even though I feel like it, it was, I also rolled my eyes at it too, but I was like, okay, well, they're building it up a little bit. I can't wait to see how that plays off and to see a couple issues where, you know, Eddie and, and Kang are, I guess, learning from each other. The downside is they cram all of that in this issue. So all that buildup of like Kang becoming friends with Eddie and and them having these, the you know, century worth of friendship or whatever it was, all that's told over the course of this one issue and they breeze through it. It's, you know, hey, they meet each other and Kang's like, oh, this is interesting. No, I've never met you before, Eddie. But this, what a lovely meeting this is. That means you are moving through time and you're looking to conquer as well. And as a fellow conqueror, I'm curious, you know, keep my friends close, my enemies closer kind of thing. And that's how Kang approaches Eddie. And he's like, I'll teach you a few things about time travel and, you know, getting a sense of yourself as you move through time and some of these abilities you have as Tiro. Um, but in exchange, I want you to help me with something. And that's what they work out. And what they do is Tiro creates an army of symbiotes and uses them with or has already had an army of symbiotes from Meridius that uh, Kang is using. And Tiro is like, all right, well, I can help you master these you know, symbiote drones and we can use these to wipe out some alien races that will stand against you at some point. They don't wipe out Earth, though, but they wipe out some like lizard race or something that might stand against Kang somewhere down the line. So Kang's happy about that. He's like, OK, let's work together. And through that period, he trains Tiro and they work together. And then Tiro eventually comes to the revelation that where all this is leading, where Meridius and all this stuff is leading is to an item called Venom World, which I'm guessing is Earth. Uh, completely covered in symbiote and becoming venom and that is apparently the end goal or the end of this story as as uh, meridius and tiro and these versions of eddie are come are going to come to know it and so through that revelation and, and by seeing the big picture that is the final thing that tips him over into transforming into meridius so again three images here and close up on the eye then you see Venom World, and then now we go backwards. And then we start on the eye where it ended here. We start on the eye here and work our way to the wider shot. And then again, you go through this and you have this image here where it's, you know, Meridius looking in the mirror and then realizing that Dylan as Codex is a major factor in his plans. It also mirrors this where he was training with Kang the Conqueror. So that's what I mean. Like the book, once it hits this point, all the panels that, you know, worked their way, if it was three panels on one page or four or whatever, they are now rep repeated in reverse uh, from here on out. So that's, they actually execute a palindrome visually in this book um, and story-wise where you work your way to the middle of the story and then work your way back to the, the beginning, only instead of seeing it through the eyes of Tiro, you see it through the eyes of Meridius. So it's a cool concept. I think Al Ewing is good at that. He's a big concept guy. He thinks really big. But like I said, in doing so, he breezed through something that I was a little curious about, which is how does Kang and Eddie, how does their friendship work? And and how how neat that must be to tell that story. And they just breeze right through it. So I'm thinking they're doing that because they have a Carnage crossover coming up. Um, they also, Al, I think, had an idea to do a palindrome comic. That was probably first and foremost. And then so he's like, all right, we got to get that story told in one issue. And then we have a Carnage crossover coming up with Dylan and Carnage and everything. And then at, after that, I'm sure they're going to build to their final story. And maybe between issues 40 and 50, that could be Al Ewing's goal to end the book at that time and wrap up this whole Meridius thing. I'm going to assume. I don't know. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if it works out. Uh, and they, may, they might try to time it to release or start releasing around the time of the third movie, which comes out in November. So that would make sense because at that point they'll be closer to issue 40 and they can start a big crossover event if they want to. So, yeah, I don't know. I, but do you go into the hive and there's that point in time where Meridius uses Kang and he takes over Kang's operation not once he becomes Meridius and he says the same thing to Kang that Kang said to him, again, doing the palindrome thing. And he goes to the end of time and they wipe out Earth, essentially, or a civilization and they go into the hive there and dive in and destroy the hive from the inside. And that's where he builds the garden. And at one point, the garden was just there at the end of one timeline, but then Meridius brought it into 
like a nexus world in between a bunch of timelines and kind of being its own thing and Kang didn't have access to it until issue 25, which we'll talk about, but because of an event that happens here. So again, we're at the end of the book. Meridius is talking to Tiro, um, and now he's doing, you're seeing the story through Meridius's eyes. And he's being mean to Tiro, and Tiro didn't like that earlier, and now we see Meridius going, wow, I don't even feel sympathy because Tiro is me. It's Eddie, um, it, but it's the version of me before I became Meridius. But look at him. He's a snarling, sniveling worm who's just trying to get information out of me. He's pathetic compared to what I am now. Someone who took down and, and conquered Kang the Conqueror and took over his operation. You know, he's like, I'm better now. And I've taken over time and I have this plan in motion. So all these other, you know, Venoms and versions of me from the past, they're all beneath me. But they have to stay here at the Garden of Time because we need that timeline to happen where everyone passes through here. So, but he's like, but what was, you know, Tiro trying to tell me or what was I trying to tell myself when I was Tiro? He's forgot about the seventh Eddie. And so he forgot about the eventuality out there who has now helped this Eddie Brock you know, along with Kang and Dr. Doom, as we're going to find out in the next episode when we cover it, to give him a time machine called Rosebud 2, which was a, it's a Fantastic Four time machine that Reed Richards built. And now Eddie is entering the garden as an eighth Eddie, and he's now the wild card again. And by doing this, though, it is going to undo and unravel everything that Meridius has been building, little to Meridius's knowledge. And we're going to find out how that happens in the next episode. But this was just cool the way they did it with the palindrome thing. It was just neat. I mean, it's a cool concept. Again, unfortunately, it sacrifices some story that I've been waiting to read for the concept. I wish it didn't do that. I wish Al could have done a better job uh, of balancing those two things or telling the Kang thing in another story. But I guess they've already got through all the other stuff. This was the only time that, you know, it made sense to have Tiro be the one to work with Kang because all the other versions Kang hadn't met yet. Uh, so he was a, so it makes sense that it had to be Tiro, but it just it felt really quick. And and I personally would have liked to have seen more of that story. So who knows? Maybe one day a writer will tell a miniseries where they tell a little bit more, flesh that out a little bit, do flashbacks to it. I mean, that's always possible. I think Al told what he needed to tell to get the palindrome effect in there and to to get to the point of the story where he needed to be at at the end of this issue. So on that level, he did a good job. But just for me, as someone who was craving that connection and that friendship between you know Kang and Eddie, I was curious about it because I am a Kang fan and uh, especially how he ties into the Fantastic Four and uh, and also into ancient Egypt, you know, uh, with some of those characters and Apocalypse and, and all this stuff. Uh, and then also the Young Avengers and Iron Lad. I like that character, um, but he's not always used well. And in this, I thought, okay, Al is a good writer for Kang and he's doing an okay job at him uh, at it. But I felt like this issue, like I said, just felt like it breezed through it way too quickly for me. But that's my only criticism. Otherwise, the artwork's great, and the palindrome effect was really cool. And uh, and it's yeah, again, I think Al Ewing, he's a concept guy, so he thinks like that, and uh, and so that makes sense. And it was executed fairly well here. So that's my thoughts on the book. What are yours? Let me know down below, and we'll keep talking down there. And like I said, in the next episode, it'll be we'll be fully caught up in Venom Comics, but we're going back a few issues, and we're going to talk about issues 24 and 25 where, you know, Dr. Doom gets entered into the picture and hangs out with Eddie and they go on this adventure together through time. And it's not an adventure that Doom wants to go on, but he does. And uh, and it ties back into that Lethal Protector 2 miniseries where they kind of, you know, built their relationship where Doom tried to steal the symbiote to use it to go into hell to get his mother, you know, and that whole story. So they tie back that and, you know, tie back into that a little bit um, to give that miniseries more of a, a purpose in the timeline. But then also they set up the future of what doom is going to do and how he's going to be involved in this big venom war coming up and how he has a sleeper agent now that is in the midst of these characters to possibly take out eddie brock when the time comes so we'll talk about more about you know all that in the next episode so thank you so much for watching the show as always like share subscribe all that fun stuff and i'll see you guys in the future peace